rocks and dingle cliffs recede, to leave behind all they knew in hopes that something better lay over the horizon. When people like Falmouth boarded those ships, they often did so with no family, no friends, no money, nothing to sustain their journey but faith. Faith in the Almighty. Faith in the idea of America. Faith that it was a place where you could be prosperous, you could be free, you could think and talk and worship as you please. A place where you could make it if you tried. And as they worked and struggled and sacrificed and sometimes experienced great discrimination to build that better life for the next generation, they passed on that faith to their children and to their children's children. An inheritance that their great, great, great grandchildren like me still carry with them. We call it the American dream. It's the dream that Falmouth Carney was attracted to when he went to America. It's the dream that drew my own father to America from a small village in Africa. It's a dream that we've carried forward, sometimes through stormy waters, sometimes at great cost, for more than two centuries. And for my own sake, I'm grateful they made those journeys, because if they hadn't, you'd be listening to somebody else speak right now. And for America's sake, we're grateful so many others from this land took that chance as well. After all, never has a nation so small inspired so much in another. signatures are on our founding documents. Irish blood was spilled on our battlefields. Irish sweat built our great cities. Our spirit is eternally refreshed by Irish story and Irish song. Our public life by the humor and heart and dedication of servants with names like Kennedy and Reagan, O'Neill, and Moynihan. So you could say there's always been a little green behind the red, white, and blue. When the father of our country, George Washington, needed an army, it was the fierce fighting of your sons that caused the British official to lament we have lost America through the Irish. And as, and as George Washington said himself, when our friendless standards were first unfurled, who were the strangers who first mustered around our staff? And when it reeled in the light, who more brilliantly sustained it than Aaron's generous sons? When we strove to blot out the stain of slavery and advance the rights of man. We found common cause with your struggles against oppression. Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave, and our great abolitionist forged an unlikely friendship right here in Dublin with your great liberator, Daniel O'Connell. His time here, Frederick Douglass said, defined him not as a color, but as a man. And it strengthened the nonviolent campaign he would return home to wage. And recently, some of their descendants met here in Dublin to commemorate and continue that friendship between Douglass and O'Connell. When Abraham Lincoln struggled to preserve our young union. More than 100,000 
Irish and Irish Americans join the cause with units like the Irish Brigade charging into battle, green flags with gold harp waving alongside our star-spangled banner. When depression gripped America, Ireland sent tens of thousands of packages of shamrocks to cheer up its countrymen, saying, may the message of Aaron Shamrocks bring joy to those away. And when an Iron Curtain fell across this continent and our way of life was challenged, it was our first Irish president, our first Catholic president, John F. Kennedy, who made us believe 50 years ago this week that mankind could do something big and bold and ambitious as walk on the moon. He made us dream again. That is the story of America and Ireland. That's the tale of our brawn and our blood side by side in making and remaking a nation, pulling it westward, pulling it skyward, moving it forward again and again and again. And that is our task again today. I think we all realize that both of our nations have faced great trials in recent years, including recessions so severe that many of our people are still trying to fight their way out. And naturally, our concern turns to our families, our friends, and our neighbors. And some in this enormous audience are thinking about their own prospects and their own futures. Those of us who are parents wonder what it will mean for our children and young people like so many who are here today. Will you see the same progress we've seen since we were your age? Will you inherit futures as big and as bright as the ones that we inherited? Will, you, will your dreams remain alive in our time? This nation has faced those questions before. When your land couldn't feed those who tilled it, when the boats leaving these shores held some of your brightest minds,